Hi, I'm Raylene Blackburn. I'm the Aboriginal Liaison Officer for Campbelltown and Camden Hospitals. I fall under the Social Work Department. I'm an Anawan woman from the New England area, born and raised in Armadale. I moved to Sydney 1982. I moved to Sydney to take up a position with the Australian Customs Service. Worked there for 10 years, had my two children, stopped working for a while to look after my girls, did a little bit of working on like through my own business and yeah so I worked privately for a while and then um, started my career with the hospital. I started my career in 2009 um, in Campbelltown Hospital as an admin trainee, Aboriginal admin trainee in clinical information um, worked there for seven months, didn't complete my traineeship as I was successful in receiving a promotion to the clinical support officer, grade two, no it was a grade three, sorry, and that was with our medical assessment unit helping the numb of the ward and then six years ago I was successful in applying for and receiving the promotion to Aboriginal Liaison Officer where I'm currently working at the moment with the hospital as I said with social work um, supported by social work um, and advocating on behalf of our patients in the hospital. I first heard about the traineeship was when my youngest daughter, she applied. We came to a uh, an information day here at the hospital about all the traineeships, whether it was admin, cleaning, nursing, and she was successful in applying and receiving a position here as a as an administrative trainee. I remember that first week, her orientation, I sat in with her, um, sat at the back, cause I, you know, didn't want to get involved in anything. And I remember the applicants there, the successful people kept saying to me, why aren't you here with us? And I was like, ah, oh, I think I'm too old. And they're like, no, you're not, you know, you can do it. So then when the next lot of trainees came up, I applied and yeah, it was a step in the door for me. Um, I had tried other positions, but for some reason wasn't um, successful but this traineeship gave me a chance to come in, show my, you know, show my abilities. And through that, there's no stopping the trainees who, who come in you. It's yourself that stop. You can apply for any job, um, any promotion. You will do oyster. That's what I found with me anyway. It was a big step. I find the experience working here in health. Um, they're very supportive of our Aboriginal, especially myself being the Aboriginal Liaison Officer, very supportive of my role, the, the staff that work here, also our patients. Um, if I need anything or suggest anything to our managers, general manager, um, nothing seems to be an issue with our Aboriginal patients or staff or myself. Um, I have worked in the government departments before but not as an Aboriginal um, staff member. I found that this very supportive of our Aboriginal staff, patients and any of our, you know, if we need anything, they're pretty good. They'll help us with what we need. My experience with working at the hospital, Campbelltown Hospital. Um, starting as a trainee, um, as an Aboriginal trainee, I didn't really know a lot of the Aboriginal staff that worked here, only the trainees that started with us, my daughter who was already here and the trainees that started with her. Then the opportunities that I had when I was in clinical information, I, I wasn't a very confident person when I first started. So being in clinical information, I was out of the clinical area, so I wasn't on the ward working with patients and families and staff. I was in working with the clinical records and putting, you know, paper in order, that sort of thing. So it was a good start for me to build my confidence up. And then I remember my manager saying to me seven months into it, you know, I feel confident that you could start applying for jobs. And I think it was that confidence that he had in me that gave me confidence to apply for the position that I went for the CSO. And I think the only reason I applied applied for it to start with because it was Aboriginal staff. They told me they'd be, you know, these positions put away for Aboriginal staff. And then after being successful, I found out they weren't. 
so it was sort of like a false um, positive type thing for me but I was successful in getting one of the positions and then from there going to the Aboriginal Liaison Officer I didn't know whether I would go for the position because I thought you had to have all these you know degrees and you know college and university and that and it was one of the, the staff one of our directors had said to me not that I'm putting down the universities or anything but she said to me it's a piece of paper so I applied for the Aboriginal Liaison Officer position and here I am today and over the years especially as an Aboriginal liaison officer coming from an admin background and trainee background I've sort of taken on the role of looking after our trainees because I think it's important that we nurture them and help them along and you know let them know that if you work meet all the criteria there's a permanent job at the end of it and you're open to you know your career move on, do what you want to do. You don't have to stay in that one position. You can move on and become an ALO or an Aboriginal health worker. Having that and looking after our trainees, plus I've noticed that in the being the Aboriginal Liaison Officer, more of our staff are identifying. Um, we've got our cluster meetings that we have three monthly. Uh, we're getting more and more of our staff coming to those meetings. Plus the hospital is very um, supportive of our, like if we have our cluster meetings we're having you know with our NADOC days off um, the hospital is very supportive with our staff with attending Aboriginal cultural events the impact um, this position has had on my personal and professional life is that it has given me a lot of confidence um, I've grown in the community as well as in my position building those rapport with the community, our staff, our patients, um, I suppose to with our patients and the community letting them know that the hospital has that um, support. They've given our people that support whether you're working here, you're here as a patient or even just visiting, you know, the, the hospital is very supportive and I've found that having the connection with country, our culture, the community is important in this role. Also with my family, like being with or doing the position that I'm doing, it's helped me develop in the role. Um, with a lot of, you don't realise that working with your patients here in the hospital also impacts your personal life or sometimes your personal life impacts your professional life because what you're dealing with at work you're also dealing with at home and it's helping you to deal with that a little bit better both personally and professionally. So yeah it impacts a lot Especially, I, I think, being an Aboriginal woman and in the role that, we're do, that I'm doing as well. My career aspirations at the moment, I'm happy to stay where I am as the Aboriginal Liaison Officer. I feel that I still have some unfinished business um, in the role. But going from an admin position to a clinical support officer, like going from clinical information to an area that, you know, on the wards, that was a huge big leap for me. Like I was too scared to go out onto the wards. I remember I had to do an audit of the bed buzzers and I didn't want to do it. I was too scared because, you know, there's sick people out there in the beds, you know, they're not here for holiday. And I remember just the first few months, I couldn't do it, made up all the excuses under the sun. And then it wasn't until that confidence, I suppose, that, you know, you go in, you explain to the patient why you're here and the reason that. And then, you know, most of the patients just want to have a chat. So it was like, okay, I'm not going out there to disturb them, you know, you're going out there, have a chat, build that rapport with them. That was a big game changer for me, I suppose. And I and my numb at the time kept saying, Me, we'll make a nurse out of you yet. Um, but that was that was big for me, going out into 
the beds and you know into their rooms and that and then going from a clinical support officer to Aboriginal health worker again um, the confidence to apply for that position it was a big step in my role it is a, it is a career choice at the time it was like oh yeah it's another position but it's not it's you're looking after our people we're looking after you know making sure that they're they're well looked after while they're in hospital but also that they're supported when they leave hospital so you're making a difference so it is a career do i want to stay here um i am content in my position um, if they upgraded it, would be really good. I would definitely stay. There are opportunities to become a senior Aboriginal health worker. At the moment, yeah, I'm still debating about that. But we have roles to play and each one of us has an important role. And just letting people know and our staff know that whatever you do, you'll make a difference and there's careers out there. You don't have to be stuck in the one area and become a health worker. Some of the responsibilities and duties of my position as Aboriginal Liaison Officer, we advocate on behalf of our patients. So we go and visit them, find out what they need if they're not. A lot of our people, you know, they'll have a doctor there with them and they'll be nodding their head you know the doctor saying this is wrong that's wrong you know we've got these results back and the patient's nodding and you can usually tell whether they understand or not or they're just nodding for the sake of nodding so our role is to ask the patient do you understand what the doctor has just said and a lot of times they'll go no i don't so you ask the doctor to re-explain what they've just told the patient in simpler words because the doctors and the staff use big medical terminology which sometimes I don't even understand. So you ask them just to re-explain what the diagnosis is or you know the results that they've got back so that the patient knows in similar or easier terms. Um, also checking that the patient, if they're being ready to discharge, that they have supports at home. Find out who they're living with, you know, if they're going home to an empty house, um, if they've got family living with them, whether it's a husband or a daughter or, you know, son living at home, and if they need equipment or they might need services put in place. So, you know, we organise for the service to help for help to to be put into place so that they're going home with either domestic and personal care uh, if they need equipment um, like a four-wheel walker or over the toilet aid or a shower chair something like that to help them at home so that our patients can go home and stay home we don't want them bouncing back because of you know they didn't have the right equipment or the right services at home Sometimes it's just going and talking to the patients, listening to them, you know, they might just want to chat. You go and visit them and they don't want anything, you know, they're just happy to, for someone to listen to them, have a chat, talk about life type things. Um, the ALO role is right across the hospital. We go to the emergency department, we're at paediatrics, we're at the birthing unit, we're in the maternity ward, we go to the special care nursery, we're up to the surgical wards, we go to medical wards. Um, so we're dealing with patients from newborn to death. Um, and it's just being there for those patients, linking them into services if they need to, you know, our AMS, our Aboriginal Medical Service, which is Tharawal, linking them in with them. If they're not sure, if they've never heard of Tharawal, we give them a brochure on Tharawal. Yeah, so our partnership with Tharawal, that all the services that they have up there that our patients can go to. We have our Aboriginal Chronic Care Program that our Aboriginal health workers that will pick them up as our patients. We have our Bull and Diddy Gadiga, the sustained home visiting team. Um, we've got the social workers out there as well. So we've got a lot of services 
for our patients to be linked into. So it's important that when they come into hospital that they're asked the question if they identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, because if they don't, then they miss out on seeing myself, but also linking them into those services out into the community. So it's important that when they come through, they're identified, they get put on the system as being Aboriginal. My day um, in the life of an Aboriginal liaison officer is I'll come in in the morning, I print up a bed statement and that's of the whole ward and it's all our patients that have identified as Aboriginal. So that's why it's important that they are asked the question and they identify. So I print that up, we go, I check on the wards, oh, sorry, on the computer, what they're in for, if they're going to have tests, you know, they might come in, they might need to go and have a surgery, something like that. I then go and visit them, introduce myself if I've never met them before, give them my brochure, which has my mobile number on it. Um, also, a little bit of information about myself, the hospital, that sort of thing. Have a chat, find out if they have any chronic diseases, put an alert on the system so that they are picked up by our Aboriginal chronic care team. Um, if they're in maternity and they've had babies, sometimes our non-Aboriginal mums who are carrying Aboriginal babies, those babies don't get identified, which is important because they can get those services as well. So going and checking on mum, make sure, you know, they might be linked in with the BG girls or, you know, they might be known to the Bulla Bulla girls at Thurwell. Um, just having a chat, finding out what they need. Sometimes, like I said, they don't need anything. Other times, you know, they, they might need support with Centrelink. So we can ring them, see what they need. You know, if there's an, an, an interview they need to go to, we can let them know that they're in hospital. Also, um, we Department of Housing, find out what's going on with their application, their transfer, so and so. I also had a patient that came in and he was worried about his electricity bill and you know he'd received the bill and it was like $1,500. Going in, with his permission of course, sorting it out and the thing was that you know someone had come to the house to change his electricity over but he hadn't sorted that out with his settling so the money was still going to the old bill and he, you know he was running up the new bill and it was just working out through you know sorting it all out for him so that the money that was going to the old bill could be recredited to the new bill so in the end it was quite frustrating and confusing for myself but we worked it out and he ended up not having a bill. I think he had a couple extra dollars in the bank, which was good. So that was that was rewarding, knowing that we can go in, sort out these issues for them. Sometimes there's some issues you can't sort, like housing's a big issue, you know. We just can't get them a house straight away. That's just out of our control. That's frustrating. Other times, like, we support our mums through hard times as well, like we've had, um, stillborns it's being there listening to the mums just I think to being there for them supporting them talking to them or even just letting them talk vent yell scream you know you're there for them you let them know that you know you understand what they're going through the compassion you know be the empathy that sort of thing it's hard some of the the situations we've been in you can distance yourself from those situations other times it's harder because it hits home being a mother and a woman yeah dealing with a stillborn that sort of thing it does you do realise how lucky you are that you've got your children, they're grown up, that sort of thing. But you do take a lot of it on. Learning to deal with that. We have cultural supervision. We have supervision with the social workers. We, we have debrief as well. Like every ward has a social work, a worker. So you go and you talk to them if they're really, uh, there's issues there that you need the social worker with you, you work with them. You're in there to support the patient, they're in there to do their job, whether you know it's for nursing home placement or something like that. Same with our child and women, we have social workers in there, you're, you're working with them to support the patients, the mums, the bubs. And then afterwards, you know, we do lose a lot of our patients, you know, we debrief with the social workers, talk about it, go to an area where it's, you know, safe, 
private sit talk you know and then we have our cultural supervision and then sometimes we just go walk about you just need to get out of the office. Having a supportive supervisor, manager is really, really important and I'm so lucky I have good support staff. Knowing that these people are there I think makes our job or my job a lot easier. It's a rewarding. You do have your highs and lows in the position like every position. I think the highs outweigh the lows and it's been, it's, it is quite rewarding, but the ALO job is, and the role is quite diverse. You, you, as I said, you right across the hospital, you could be called down to ED with a patient that has mental health issues, um, de-escalating that situation. Then you're off to paediatrics, you know, a mum that's come in, the baby's got respiratory problems, you know, calming mum down, making sure baby's okay. Sometimes you're there to help, you know, they've come in, they've got no food. We have had patients that have come from out of town, got nowhere to stay, no family. Um, so we have a rotary lodge here that, you know, if they're available, the rooms, we can use those. The highlights of the hospital, I've found that they are so supportive. We have um, a birthing unit room that's been, has artwork that we've set up for our, not only for our Aboriginal patients, for non-Aboriginal patients to use and it has like the the paintings and that there. We have a, a corridor with some artwork in it. We have our Uncle Ivan room, which is for our patients and their families, which does get used quite extensively. We've had families that I've walked in and, you know, there's bodies everywhere where they've slept overnight. That's what the room's for. We have a healing garden that um, has a lot of, in well, it's all Indigenous plants to the area, to the Durrawal area. There's plants down there that we can eat, there's berries, there's the, the tea tree tree. <laughs> um, the doors are also wide enough that a wheelchair and a bed can go through. We organise that with the last redevelopment. For a lot of our patients that are bed bound and they're stuck in their room, we can take the bed down into the garden so they can get out into the fresh air, get some sun, get, um, you know, go into that garden. Um, and it, that garden's for everyone. It's not just for our Aboriginal patients and families. Also, with the redevelopment that's coming up, the hospital has been very supportive in our Aboriginal culture being enveloped into the build, not add on to the build. So having consultation with the community, with our stakeholders, with Thurawal, having them involved now in the early stages of the redevelopment so that once the build goes ahead, we'll incorporate the, the Durrawal history, you know, Appen Massacre, the, the acknowledgement will be there. We'll have the, the Liebert, will be part of the main foyer of the, of the new build. So the hospital has been very, very supportive and I've seen a, a lot of changes with the hosp positive changes for our Aboriginal people and staff. It's a positive impact to our hospital having Aboriginal staff um, employed um, coming through the emergency department, having an Aboriginal staff member sitting at the front desk there, the, the community, our patients, most of our staff members live here. So they're, you know, patients that are coming through the door are family, friends, they've gone to school with them, they're related somewhere down the track. So having that familiar face at the front of the hospital plus within the hospital, the Patients, family, community are a bit more relaxed when they come in to visit. They know that, well, for instance, the hospital supports Aboriginal workers. So having the staff there for our patients to see makes them feel a bit more relaxed knowing that if they need to ask a question or find out what's going on or where they're in the list, they can go up and ask that staff member. You know, if, if they can't ask a, a doctor or a nurse or, you know, one of the specialists, they know they can go up and ask an Aboriginal worker. 
and they'll get their answer. You know, they, they're happy to go and look. I know for myself, if I've got someone lost in the corridors, you know, I'll either take them there myself or, you know, you give them the directions. Or It's always a staff member, Aboriginal staff member, that's happy to go out of their way, especially for family, friends and the community. Building stronger relationships with our clients, patients. The patient living in the area, as well as working in the area. You know these people that are coming through. You see them in the street, you see them at the shops. Um, you build that rapport with them, like you, you know them. They're happy to come and see you when they come in. Just listening to our patients. Um, like I said, building that rapport with them, knowing, and I also think, and I say this to other ALOs, get yourself out into the community, let them know that you are part of the community, build that rapport, build that connection with them, with your local AMS, with the community, with, the, with your staff, also let your staff know that you're here, you're here for them as well as the patients, and that you know, my door's always open in my office and that's not just for our Aboriginal staff, it's for everyone. So if they want to come in and rant and rave and vent, um, they can. Same with our patients. I've often had patients, family members walk past and just pop in. Having that connection with them, knowing that you're, you're there for them you'll you listen and I think that's the big thing as well that they know if, if you listen and you follow through on what you're going to do they will trust you building that trust is a big thing okay three benefits of working in the hospital is it's a government job security reliability you have that, you know, the reliability of having a stable job. And two, I think for myself, is the support that I have here within the hospital and with um, the department that I'm in. Plus the support from all services involved with our Aboriginal patient, and uh, not patients, sorry, with our Aboriginal staff members. Some of the skills I think that a person would need to become an Aboriginal Liaison Officer is reliability, because you're there for your patients. Sensitivity, because the people we deal with, you, de you, you need to be able to, and sometimes I, I'm, I say I'm a bit of a sook, because you know I show my emotions. So being able to do that shows empathy with your, your patient as well, when, when it's needed, but then also being able to be strong for your patient as well, you know, because you've got, say, a patient that's dying and you need to be strong for the family, be supportive for, this, for the family, sorry. Being able to, which I, the confidence as well to speak up for that family which I've been in the role for six years I've found that probably the last three I have that confidence to be able to stand up and say no this patient is not ready to go home or this patient can't be discharged because they don't have the services in place that is something that grows with the position that you're in definitely being a good listener being able to sit and listen to your patient, taking taking in everything that they say, you know, and not not jumping in and, and just assuming that this is what they want and that's what they want. You need to listen to the patient and being able to advocate quite well for your patient with the doctors, with the nurses, with the nums, you know, with the specialists out there, with our allied health, you know, if they need to have an OT report done, we need it done before they leave. Being, uh, being assertive as well, again, that's something that has grown with me over the years. It's not something that I was comfortable with to start with. It is important to have Aboriginal staff employed throughout the hospital, one for our patients, so that they are comfortable, because we, ha we have a high population out here of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So knowing that there's positions here and they're filled by our Aboriginal patients. Also to it gives the family and visitors here, they can look at it and go, oh, 
I'd like to get into the hospital, you know, or Campbelltown or whatever hospital. And, you know, they do have staff. We also have a high cultural background here as well. So seeing other nationalities, cultural cultures here, but also seeing our Aboriginal staff, it's positive for the, the community, it's positive for our own families that, you know, they can come in and work with our staff, with our patients, sorry. Um, also for the, the young Aboriginals coming up through school, you know, they're coming in, they're visiting, they're seeing, you know, Aboriginal cleaners, Aboriginal admin. It's something that they can aspire to and we have that security here. You know, you, you know you can come in and you work your butt off, especially as a trainee, you will be offered a permanent position. And like I said before, the world's your oyster once you're in here. So having Aboriginal staff, it, it's an opportunity for them if they want a career in, in the hospital or even for myself starting as a mature age person there's no boundaries um, whereas some other agencies facilities you know they looked at my age and you know I was too old whereas here at the hospital they didn't look at my age they looked at um, my ability or you know gave me a chance anyway 